Hi, this is Mark O'Connell, and you're listening to That UFO Podcast. Hi everyone, and welcome back to That UFO Podcast. My name is Andy, and delighted to have with me on the podcast today, retired US Army Colonel, uh, author, lecturer, and so much more, Mr. John B. Alexander. John, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Andy. Glad to be here. It's very good to finally have you. Uh, the listeners know that we had to reschedule due to my internet being cut off on the evening, so no wacky conspiracies. We think it was just the internet provider going out, but I'm very glad uh, you've given me the time to, to reschedule, so I do appreciate that. Uh, John, a whole lot to, to cover with you in the time we have, and I want to start right back in the beginning. Uh, 1947, I believe you were 10 years old, and in your school you gave a radio broadcast on UFOs. Can you tell the listeners a little bit about that, um, and what was your fascination with the subject at that early age? Well, obviously that was a little different, and that was an internal school thing, not a external broadcast sort of thing. But I went to yeah. a very unusual school that was a derivative of what became the University of Wisconsin uh, at La Crosse. Uh, at that time, it was a teacher school, and they had... Uh, a school that was, we were basically guinea pigs. Uh, so that we were the ones that the student teachers uh, got to teach. But because of that, we had access to <clears throat> resources that most don't. And one of them was a broadcast. And periodically, about every week, one of the students would go out and make a broadcast on the topic of their choice. And it was just about that time that UFOs were breaking and I made that the topic of my choice. What was your fascination on the UFO subject in 1947? What was influencing you? Well, you've got to remember that 47, uh, the whole thing is just starting to hit public consciousness. Uh, the uh, sightings by Ken Arnold and things like that were making the newspapers. And so it, it was making uh, national news uh, at time. Uh, as I recall, though, that this was a, kind of a skeptic thing that said, oh, Skyhook, that uh, and instead of being real UFOs, where we probably went, but this was spawning balloons and said, oh, it must be balloons that are misidentified and all that. And world, well, some of it's changed, some of it hasn't. We still get the balloon explanation. And in fact, you know, well, probably. 95% of sightings are misidentifications of something with a prosaic response, but there is the residual that makes it really interesting. Yeah, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Um, and was there anything at that early age that you'd had your own experiences with any UFOs, anything to do with the paranormal ghosts? Was it just it was in the news, it was becoming the no, zeitgeist? Not at that time. Uh, all of that sort of came along much later. Uh, as you know, I did a book called uh, Reality Denied, <clears throat> in which I talked about a whole series of events that have been involved in, both uh, from personal experience, both things we did with the military, got more actively involved. And uh, so a, a lot of weird shit just sort of happens around me. Yeah, it certainly did. And just before we get to that that military point in your life, just to cover the the gap between school age and getting into the military, was there anything that kept your interest in the UFO, the paranormal at that time, or was it something that waned but came back to you as as you kind of hit those kind of teenage and teenage years? I, I cannot even begin to address that. I don't know. It wasn't like I had a burning interest. I was interested. I mean, we were just beginning to talk about space travel and things of that nature. And I did find that uh, fascinating as well. So there was, a, well, I call the real world street component to it, certainly, as well as here was the UFO phenomena that was just burgeoning at the time. So during that time in the military, let's get to it. Um, you've talked about many experiences, including uh, with life after death and that other at the end, was there any event or events that convinced you most that is something that goes on when the physical body dies? Uh, 
I will, again, that's so broad, I'm not sure how to advance it. Um, uh, well, it's one of these serendipitous events uh, that occurred. Um, and this goes into the 1970s or thereabout. <clears throat> I had met uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and she and Raymond Moody were the first ones talking about continuation of consciousness and what became near-death studies. Um, I was getting ready to do a doctorate and had to punch out a, uh, uh, obligatory reports and things. And I got a call one day, I was in my office, uh, I was then assigned at uh, Fort McPherson, Georgia in Atlanta. I got a call kind of out of the blue that uh, said, this is Elizabeth's secretary. Well, I had, I guess precursor, I had sent her a letter because I had attended a workshop called Life, Death and Transition, uh, which was very neat. We can talk about this some if you wish, but I had just sent her a note that said, gee, thanks. It was very impactful. And anyway, and this is the days when you could, you know, go out and meet people at the gate. And the secretary said, Elizabeth will be passing through tomorrow. So you've got two hours. Uh, can you meet her? Well, of course. And uh, from that, I said, well, I think I'm supposed to ask you a question. And was, would, would you consider being the head of my doctoral committee? And she said, oh, yes. <laughs> just kind of a surprise. And uh, so like I said, the rest sort of became history. Um, the dissertation was on the changes that took place in people who attended the life, death, and transition workshops, which was very impactful in that. And of course, I also led, led to some work in what I call the straight world, including the development of Children's Hospice International, which was first addressing pediatric hospice. And then uh, uh, Ken Rang and the people were just starting to write books. Uh, of course, Ray Moody's Life After Life had come out. And uh, IONS, the International Association for Near Death Studies, was just coming into existence. And I contacted them and went up and then joined the board and eventually became the president, but knowing all of the key people who were working in that area. How was that sort of conversation? addressed at that time within the military you know even talking about uh, life after death the paranormal was it uh, entertained at all no uh, the military i remember i was on the train as i was assigned in washington but the stuff with ions and all was separate now it was about the same time the remote viewing program was just kind of coming in, into existence and um, the whole backstory was that uh, I had attended a conference there in the DC area and um, there was a wife of a colonel who was running the conference and said, oh, you must meet and mention another wife. And it turned to be out uh, Dick Stillwell. Well, Stillwell was a retired four-star general who was then DEPSEC DEP, I believe, or in other words, the number two guy in the Pentagon. And in my straight world job, I was an inspector general and doing all of that, but I got called up. I said, can you go and meet? I'm a lieutenant colonel at the time. And said, you know, arrange for me to meet with him. And which I did alone. Now that's so highly unusual because normally uh, lowly lieutenant colonels do not go see four stars or secretaries without what we call head bobbers. In other words, other generals coming around or you know, shake their head in agreement with whatever you were going to say. Um, but that was not the case. And uh, it was about 12.30 and went up and had a very interesting talk with him and we were talking about some of it was about what the Soviets were doing at the time because we were following some of that research. This is again the bad old days. It was the Soviet Union as opposed to Russia. 
And uh, so we had an interesting discussion. He says, well, who do you work for? And I told him, Inspector General. So I went back to my office. And about uh, three to four hours later, the chief of staff uh, from the Inspector General's office came in and said, oh, tomorrow morning you don't work here anymore. And they had, he had moved me just instantly to somebody that he thought would be compatible. And that eventually emerged more with uh, General Sobelbein, who was the head of Intelligence Security Command and did have a remote viewing program and did have personal interests in a range of phenomena. So we went off and did some wild, wonderful things there. Now, that program was famously portrayed and given the Hollywood treatment in the book and the movie, The, the Men Who Stare at Goats. Um, that, well, that's... wait, wait, wait. No, no, I've got to drop that. <laughs> Go for it. Please, no, please the, do, the yeah. The point with Ronson, as I say, he took this much truth, he wrote this much, and then they made the movie. Yeah. So you've got a tiny fragment of what the actual truth was. Um, and it was interesting because when the book came out, it was a book by the same name first, and I happened to pick it up and then reading it to damn, that's me, because he uses our real names uh, in the book. And um, so then I think he was on Coast to Coast or something like that. And talks about, because in the book it's like he's interviewing me. I asked, he said, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I have never met this guy. You know, how can this be true? Now, there was a guy from the UK, John Sargent, who was a filmmaker whom I had met and did meet on a number of occasions, and had filmed with. And anyway, Ronson wrote back and he mentioned something so specific about the house. I said, he must have been here. Nobody would know that without knowing it. So I went back and I checked my notes and I found where Sargent was here and had done an interview. And I just said John Lawson. So kind of like he was a gripper. So he just happened to be, you know, standing by, but he's uh, in the book, he becomes like the primary investigator or uh, auditor yeah. or whatnot. So um, like I say, I had to admit that uh, he had been there. I going to apologize. Nose was running just a bit today. But That's um, all right. anyway, um, so yeah, he was there, but it's kind of like somebody overhearing our conversation and saying they're doing the interview as opposed to you or something like that. And um, I did meet Greg, what's his name? The guy who works with Clooney. Uh, and we address what's real, what's not real, and that. And, I said, oh, it's a comedy. We we understood that. But, yeah. So, um, take it with a pinch of salt. And that's why I say the Hollywood treatment, because I know what it's like that you can you can give one sentence in a whole movie and series of movies comes <laughs> off of that. So the, the movie itself, if people haven't seen it, for me, it's worth watching in terms of a comedy, but it's not a historical documentary. And if I remember oh. correctly, John, at the start of the movie, the first thing that comes up, it basically says, more of this is true than you would care to imagine or you would even believe, and then goes well, into the movie. Th there were aspects of it, yes. You know, remote viewing was a real program. We addressed that. Uh, that uh, with some of the, the metal bending that shows up in there, yeah, I, I was doing that cloud busting. Yeah, we did that. Now, for the best of my knowledge, never tried to run through a wall. That was one of the you know, funny scenes at the start. And the other thing that I mentioned, because they get into LSD research, and I say, not only no, but hell no. But by that time, anybody that was, would have been touching LSD, I mean, you would have lost everything. Let me ask, and you mentioned things like the cloud busting, and there was remote viewing, and you, you see all sorts of weird and wonderful things were undertaken. What was the actual goal of the program? You know, you're talking about what, what are the Soviets up to? What what can we possibly get from this? Was there an objective you set out to achieve with the program itself? Well, which the program are we talking about? 
Well, just uh, when you say, but we're talking about the setup, obviously, of you know the remote viewing program, for example, and you're taken away, you're whisked away, and you're told from tomorrow. Well, you don't work. there were several aspects to it. Uh, part of it was research and development. What's you know, can we understand the basics and get a theoretical basis on how it works? The answer to that is no to this day. Uh, but they were doing straight research and development. So part of it was, can you do this? Mm -hmm. And the other aspect is because you had guys like Joe McMonagle who were very good naturals actually targeting them against specific uh, targets. Uh, in, in primarily in the Soviet, later it digressed into drug busts and, and things of that nature. Now, the problem from a scientific perspective is can you come up with a theoretical basis or understanding of how you might access data at a distance, and particularly when you're doing precognitive and retrocognitive kinds of things, i.e. transitioning time. Uh, so we don't have a good grasp on that. At the same time, had an operational capability that was going against real world targets and producing actionable intelligence. Something we hear about now is that there are factions within the, the government, especially in the US government, the halls of the Pentagon, that given their religious beliefs, they obfuscate and hinder any potential progress in the study of, of UAP and other phenomena. Is this something you encountered yourself? during your time in the military? Well, 35 years before OSAP or ATEP, which was the current program, I had run a similar, we called advanced theoretical physics. Uh, the reason for the name is what we call FOIA, or the Freedom of Information Act, had just come out. And there were lots and lots of people asking about UFOs and that, but didn't think they would ask about advanced theoretical physics or look for it. So that was the name. Now, bottom line is all of the findings that were released, yeah, that's what we knew 35 years ago. I mean, so there really wasn't a huge switch up. The main difference was this became a formalized program and actually got funded. We did not. I had worked for a number of years and when we went forward for funding, it was deemed too much of a risk. Uh, we went to SDI, what you know as Star Wars, a strategic defense initiative, and had talked to the commanding general who was running that program, which was the biggest R&D program in the Department of Defense at the time. And I can definitely tell you that the planning space aliens had absolutely nothing to do with, with the development of that. And uh, when we got done, I said, well, we'd like to you know, formalize the program and get funding. And it was, well, you got my attention, but I can't touch that. If I get caught doing this, you know, they're going, well, they're already coming after this budget, budget was so big. One of my favorite things and when I was in the Pentagon with people, I'm gonna go find the money. There are no pots of money just sitting around in stall someplace in the Pentagon. It means I'm going to take it from somebody else's program and sure. you know, you know, get a credit. So it's a zero-sum game all the time. And, and it was right. They were willing to um, say, if you can tell me what to look for, basically we can incorporate that in the algorithms. Uh, but uh, basically nothing further came about from that. During that time, from, from the end of those programs that you were involved in, to ATIP and OSAP, where you're talking about the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, did you ever hear of any other attempted startups or programs that would look at remote viewing or its potential uses? Not that I'm aware of. I mean, one of the questions that always comes up, did it go dark? You know, is there some ongoing program? And my position on that has been, I doubt it. Um, and the reason is that the talent pool was relatively small. Now, I want to differentiate between individual interest, institutional responsibility, which is one of my pet things to look at. 
That does not mean that there weren't people in the Department of Defense and various agencies going to remote viewers and saying, we look at X, Y, Z. That is very, very different from what we call a program of record. It was a formalized program that had a funding line, had all kinds of oversight and parameters that were established to it. Uh, as And that's what was true under Stargate and its prior incarnations. Um, but, it, you know, it's like UFOs remote viewing. Uh, people in the Pentagon have had psychic experiences, just like they have you know, across of all of the population. Um, so from that, they often develop a uh, thing that says, gee, I'm interested, read books, let me go ask, you know, Joe McMonagle's well-known, Paul Smith, and, and some of the others. There's an uh, organization called IRVA, the International Remote Viewing Association, uh, that I'm a founding board member of. But that, those are public, and so from that, you can de derive sources that you might choose to, uh, to go at. So I, I'm sure that that happens from time to time. But again, that's different from you know, the government doing it. One of the things I point out, I just did a recent talk on, on this, and, and the point is, rarely are these programs top-driven. I mean, there's something compelling, and therefore it comes down from on high. I'd say much more likely it's individuals who have personal interest and experience and push the, the noodle back up the chain of command and get to the point and this basically, um, we won't get into funding and, and all that, but, but you have to understand how the funding process works. It's terribly, terribly co complex. And you can move certain amounts of money around. And there are some discretionary funds, but then there's funding thresholds. As you get to bigger and bigger amounts, then you've got to go to higher and higher levels. And with that comes oversight. And, just becomes more difficult and more administratively restrictive. So that makes sense that the smaller you can keep a program with the less people involved and the less budget required, the less oversight you're going to have and the less eyes and ears you're going to have on the program. So you can almost get it started. But like you say, keeping that progression going and securing right. that higher funding is much more difficult. Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, and, um, Probably sounds like a lot, but you can probably muck about under $20 million most of the time and find covers of those individuals, uh, seniors who are, who are willing to allow someone. If you remember the OSAP pro or ATEP program that came in at $22 million. Uh, if you look at the remote viewing program, that was kind of around $20 million. But that, again, was a program of record and was... Uh, you know, did have some oversight on it. Now, let me ask, John, moving on slightly, Skinwalker Ranch has played a part in your life. Yeah. And I, am I correct in saying you were you were working in some capacity for Mr. Bob Bigelow when he acquired the ranch? Is that correct? Well, I was physically with him the day that he actually bought the ranch from Terry. Yeah. Uh, he, he went to a hotel and, Anyway, he stayed in the hotel. I stayed on the ridge line that night. It was the first one to actually spend the night uh, at the ranch after he had acquired it. Now, Mr. Bigelow's a man that twenty million dollars isn't a isn't a large amount of money to him necessarily, but he's got a real passion for the subject and obviously has put in a lot of time and money over the over the years. What did you already know yourself about the ranch before it was acquired? Not a lot. I mean, we had heard the stories. He had talked to uh, Terry, and, and we knew some of the back folklore. <clears throat> but as far as you know, all the stuff that's come to light. By the way, it was never Skinwalker Ranch. Well, I am. Uh, or, yeah. Uh, Noetics. Uh, Nid, I'm sorry, Nids had the ranch. The, the, the title Skinwalker Ranch got uh, attached after. Um, Bob had uh, 
not after he sold it, but after Nibs had, had dropped out of it. But, but it was just the ranch at the time that uh, we were doing it. But some very, very strange things definitely happened there. What particular experiences do you remember happening there? Or, you know, were, were others talking about that really stood out to you as being exceptionally strange? Wow. I mean, that's one that's so hard. It's because there were so many events that really did happen that were, uh, you know, verifiable. One of the stories that came up uh, early on was one where Terry, uh, before we had acquired it, but uh, Terry and his wife were there and they were just developing the ranch and looked out across the field. It was perfectly flat. You could see for quite a ways and here comes a dog paddling up there and then they got closer to that son of a dog, that's a wolf. And well, Terry's a pretty big guy. This thing walks up and Wolf's head is, you know, test level on him, which is really big. And says, well, somebody must have domesticated a wolf. He's getting ready to go to work and he hears this yowling. And what has happened is they had, if you're familiar with ranches, you know, the, the pipe fences around. This thing had reached under. There was a 600-pound calf there, grabbed it by the snout, and was trying to pull it back uh, under the fence. Well, Terry grabs a two by four and hits it, and that just didn't do too much. So he had a 357 Magnum, shot him at point blank range, you know, like from me to the computer screen, <laughs> out of yeah. range, can't miss. And well, that got him to drop the calf, and he went trotting off across the field. Well, Terry had an elk, elk rifle uh, that was there with 258 grain bullets. Very good shot. Hits this thing and stuff. Chunks of stuff are flying off the, uh, the body. It goes on, goes across the creek, comes up on the other side, disappears. They went over and picked up the chunks of what would have been meat and it's putrefied. Now remember it had just come off the body and putrefication mm. normally takes a lot longer. So that was certainly one of the war stories. Uh, one that absolutely happened that was uh, critical was the uh, calving season and uh, uh, Terry went out what they would do is they would find a newborn you would tag it and weigh it they tag it to identify it with the mother. He does that, and he then drives across this perfectly flat, open area, finds another newborn, tags it, weighs it, comes back, and Cap 1 is dead. Not only is Cap 1 dead, of course the mother is going berserk and all of that, but it's been eviscerated and exsanguinated, and you know, the, most of the innards and the material that had been there were gone. The ear had been sliced off and one that had the time that had looked like as clean as a laser cut or something uh, like that. We got notified immediately and uh, uh, Onet, uh, who was our DBM, was up there by that day. And uh, we looked at all the possibilities of uh, how do animals kill you know, bears, big cats. And, yeah, there are some of those in the area, but you gotta remember this is broad daylight, you know, 10 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> between 10 and 11 in the morning. Um, made absolutely no sense whatsoever that, uh, you know, <laughs> how could you do that? Now, uh, the pat phrase by the skeptic was, oh, the blood just went into the ground and was absorbed. So, in fact, I talked to the guys up in the ranch and said there was a slaughterhouse nearby. So they went and got buckets of blood and came back and went to another place and you poured it on the ground. And weeks later, you would look and say, blood was poured on the ground here and you did not see any of that you know, yeah. near, near the calf. Um, 
yeah, the stories just go on and on. And uh, uh, one of my favorites had to do with um, uh, we were had the ranch instrumented. No, Brandon Pugel, who now has it, has much more instrumentation than we did. But we had cameras there that were facing uh, out towards the west. And there was one in which you had, let's say, camera one here, camera two is in front of it. And we're both facing, you know, to the west. And we had an incident when we came in. We know when the incident happened because these things had wires coming down, went underground, back into the trailer where everything was being recorded. Because what would happen is we'd watch it, and then we would, we had guys that, that was their job was just to review the videotape. Well, in front of camera two, the one that's out in front, the wires have been pulled off with about 20 feet high. Uh, the wires had come down the length of the pipe, and you had about half a roll of duct tape. And if you ever work with duct tape, you know how sticky that stuff is and how it's almost impossible. Yeah, that's all missing. Uh, also, there's about a three foot chunk of wire that's missing from it. In addition, you've got um, uh, the PVC, what would happen when in the under the ground and had PVC protecting it. The U clamps of PVC has been pulled loose. Now, because of when the thing was pulled loose, we know when the event occurred. And when you went back and you look at the tape, well, it turns out on camera one that's looking at camera two, at the time of the incident, it just so happened that the cattle, the working ranch, happened to be milling around that you know, the post with the cameras on, and they don't move. And what we know is that if anybody approaches the cattle, they scatter automatically. Mm -hmm. So the point there is what should have been on film totally wasn't, yet this extensive amount of damage definitely occurred. We know when it occurred. It should have been on camera, but wasn't. Was there a working theory as to what was causing this? Because it's fascinating when you hear about these different events that happen at the ranch, but they almost seem at times very immature and childish. Uh, the short answer is no. And one of the problems is you have the so many different phenomena that are ongoing. And uh, I came up with something that I called precognitive sentient phenomena. I refer to it as an it, just because I have no way to explain what it might be. But as I told the folks on uh, you know, the Skinwalker program, you are not in charge. It is in charge. And it decides what you're going to do. And then when I said it was precognitive, it seems to know how we were going to respond before the event occurred. And yeah, we go ahead and oblige that and follow it from the way you would, you know, any scientific investigation. And then what would happen is continually more. It says, oh, you like that? Try this. And you get something totally different. So it seems with the ranch, it's very much a case of the best we can do, in a sense, is observe. And the, the consequence of that is, is very random and hard to predict. Were there any experiments or any any tests carried out that did provoke a stronger reaction than normal? Well, yeah, it provoked, and like I say, it seemed to know how we were going to investigate before we thought of it. And with like I say, it just always kept one step ahead. And was there ever a time where the reaction was frightening, or? No, no, you, uh, was it frightening? No, it didn't scare the people. Uh, there are some who seem to be more sensitive to the phenomena than others. And if you watch the secret of the Skinwalker Ranch, they've had several people who have experienced physical injuries that they do attribute uh, back to it, most of which cannot be uh, explained. Personally, I have not 
had that experience and I was back up when we filmed the uh, three or the session that actually just aired you know, a couple of weeks ago. Um, I never felt fear in that. Um, one of our guys who, in fact, they had seen, they were out there in the old homestead area. People watch the program, we'll, we'll know about. And there's a whole bunch of Russian olives uh, trees out there. And they were watching and they could see something go through. Now, they didn't use the program. And I said, was, it was like Predator. If you remember Predator movie, when, when the Predator, would, it would just kind of you'd see distortions. Yeah, but not the creepy crawler him, himself, but you would get uh, the choice. And so that was sort of what was described. And a message that came again telepathically we are watching you. Now, there wasn't any explanation of were we or what they're watching for or anything like that, but it was a clear message that was imparted. What are your thoughts on the work being done? You mentioned Brandon Fugel and his team. What are your thoughts on the work being done now? I'm not sure I follow the question. So compared to the time where you worked on the ranch, you know, or you were involved with the ranch with Mr. Bigelow, do you feel Brandon and his team are carrying out the experiments in a way that they are going to progress the the investigations? Well, I, I think they're doing, I mean, you need to be prepared to put a lot more money into it and really follow up on it. Um, I'm not very optimistic they will find a solution. But I think it just keeps morphing and, and staying ahead. Uh, but they do obviously see things that uh, are very unexplainable. And... Uh, I do think the phenomenon, obviously, it, it is not, you know, concentrated, well, it's concentrated in the area, but it's not, you know, confined to the sure. parameters, of, you know, where the ranch is in the whole area. And this has been going on for decades to centuries. So, I mean, it's area. And there are other places in the world that have, you know, similar kinds of phenomena. This is just one where individuals have picked up on us or are instrumenting and documenting uh, in ways that uh, others have, have not uh, captured the imagination, so to speak. You mentioned those other places around the world where you have these areas of high strangeness, maybe more of a concentration. Have well, you managed to get to these yourself? Yeah, no, I, I'd recommend YouTube there. I mean, there's a plethora of, you know, videos that are up from different places of people putting it out. And the difference between the ranch and what Bob and Brandon are doing is willing to put the resources necessary into doing these kind of experiments. Um, Give an example, though. I've uh, done a lot of work in Brazil, um, and you know, have have written uh, to that. And some of the things we've seen there are sort of equally unexplainable. The difference there's two differences. One is nobody's putting a lot of resources in specifically studying the kinds of things. You also got to remember Brazil's a really, really big place. Mm. <laughs> Most people have no idea how big the country is. Um, but having said that, there, there's a difference that I think is critical and applies to many of the things we have discussed and will discuss. Now, the people that I've dealt with are at very high levels in government and industry and, and whatnot, highly educated and in traditional institutions that are very akin to Western universities. None of them are actual Western universities, but they're there. But that clearly comes from a materialistic point of view, which is, dominates Western education. Having said that, throughout the country, you have a general acceptance of spiritism 
And so they're, they are used to incorporating it. So what I find interesting is people, again, educated with a Western materialistic viewpoint who inculcate the spiritism views and don't have any problem with that. That what I like to say is in the West, I've dealt with shamans uh, all over the world, but the idea of the real world and the spirit world, like those are separate and distinct, as opposed to you know, the shamans would see it much more of a continuum that moves you know, seamlessly uh, between them. So the, I think the, the huge difference in worldview is, is very important as to how you address many of these topics. It certainly seems, especially in the Western world, that that connection to the spiritual is something we've lost over time. And, and as you say, when you hear about these other cultures that still have that connection, that they can see it as being one and the same. And it makes that understanding or belief in different phenomena much more palatable, doesn't it? Well, let me give you a specific example. We were in West Africa uh, going to voodoo ceremonies. And first of all, voodoo is not a religion per se, it's an entire way of life and it's inculcated in everything. So that when you went out, their idea of spirits and, and everything just permeates everything. So if you found fruit, you would find wild pineapples or whatever that you're gonna pick, you would ask permission, you know, that's the thing, you know, even, you know, and have in this case vegetative objects and other have spirits and spirit related to it. So you have this interaction with it. Um, this is true in many, many places in the world. And yet we're Western view seems to be very isolated, very much, very narrowly focused on materialism. You know, we look for the God particle, the assumption that you know, cut things into smaller and smaller pieces, and soon we'll get to, you know, the hey, I just noticed they're about to start the uh, Large Hadron Collider again. We mm. put billions of dollars in, into that. Whereas the rest of the world, you know, their their worldview is very different. Um, well, they've done a lot of work in Africa. We've been in North, South, East, West Africa. And the point is, I forget the exact numbers, but you know how many doctors and other medical people that you have in these Western, you know, Europe and, and America. In much of Africa, you will have one medical personnel, not necessarily a doctor, but you know, a nurse or a practitioner or something for 10,000 people. Therefore, when you're going to deal with things like illness, you're going to approach it a lot differently. You're not going to have uh, access to allopathic medicine, lots of drugs and things like that. Some areas you do, but for much of the continent, you don't. The other aspect there is most Americans have no idea how big Africa is. I've got a map. And then I used to give presentations on Africa itself, literally wrote the book on it. But uh, the point was you can take basically all of the continents and fit them into Africa. <laughs> We're all populated one. I mean, it's huge. I want to ask, John, uh, NASA are now launching their own albeit with very small funding, independent investigation into UAP. What is your take on, in 2022, NASA getting further involved in the study of UFOs? Welcome to the club. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 it's not only facetious. Until very recently, in fact, until I guess Bill Nelson took over as the administrator, their position has been overtly hostile. To mm. these areas. Now, this doesn't mean that you didn't have astronauts and individuals who had some interest, and, but as an institution, they were very, very negative uh, on the topic. And that's unfortunate. I think now the evidence has become overwhelming and they're kind of following suit because of what DOD is doing. Now, do not believe 
that because the Department of Defense has the UAP task force or whatever, that that is widely accepted. There are plenty of people in there who just, it's like Project Blue Book and the Condon Report. The idea of the Condon Report, putting it out, was to make this go away. You know, we just don't want to deal with it. And I can understand why. I think there's a pretty good reason. Um, I, you know, I, I've said in other venues that you know I, I think the phenomena we're dealing with are more complex than cancer. So the point is, when you're going to put a small amount of resources against it, what's your probability that you're going to be able to come up with, you know, definitive answer? I think DOD has a role to play, but not the role. Uh, it is far bigger than anything. Now, I think their role is twofold. One is how do these things interacting with their platform planes and that. And two, they bring sensor systems that can make recordings that are not generally available to the public. So from a scientific perspective, that's interesting. Uh, but if you're a steward of resources, how much are you going to spend towards solving a problem that really is not a significant problem to you? With, you know, we, we've just come out of 20 years of armed conflict. And what percent of your resources are you going to put on this on something that you have a very low probability of uh, understanding? The other aspect that is non-trivial is the uh, uh, back to belief systems, but it's this religious thing that this is the work of the devil, it's demonic and all that. And that's not trivial. And we've seen that that was prevalent in the uh, remote viewing program as well. I know that Lou Alessandro has had contact with senators. Some of them will say, you're doing God's work and all that, and the others, you're going to go to hell. <laughs> you know, not supposed to deal with this. You, you mentioned Bill Nelson, the NASA administrator now, in his previous role within government, he was briefed on the UAP subject and he seems to be friendly to the subject as well, which yeah. is which is great. NASA already would have, one would presume, a lot of very good data using those sensors you mentioned and those recordings. Is that something you think that people in the UAP task force or the AOIMSG are going to get access to that historical data? Frankly, I doubt it. And one of the problems is just, you know, the amount of data. This is a problem we had in something called OSIM, open source intelligence. It's just the pure volume of information available, knowing what you're looking for and where to go find it. Because remember, what you're talking about are generally anomalous events. In other words, things that happen for a short period of time that may or may not have been reported. If they didn't interact with some system and that probably didn't get reported at all. We can talk about some of the Department of Defense like that. But um, you know, how much are you going to, again, spend resources again? All of these things from a funding perspective are a zero-sum game. So my point there is if you're going to study these things, and personally, I think you should. But if you're going to do that, what are you not going to do? I get you. And like you say, they're, they're very, very small amounts in the grand scheme of things when it comes to budgets and amounts that are generally throwaway sums of money that aren't going to be missed to, to make something go away or at least find nothing to pursue. Well, what... what uh... With Blue Book, I mean, Air Force just wanted to make it go away. We do not want to come at, you know, we, the officers who had, even though it was a part time job for the vast majority of them, uh, but they had to take reports and train and all that. Just make that go away. What you're looking at from a pure business perspective, what's the return on investment? When you're dealing with phenomenology, the probabilities are actually pretty low. Have you yourself, John, ever had any interesting conversations with those former astronauts or people at NASA 
about the UFO subject that they've just not been comfortable coming forward with? Oh, we got to remember Ed Mitchell was a uh, personal friend. We served on boards together and had lots of discussion. Uh, the one area that we agreed to disagree on, I think, was Roswell. But uh, that, another one who said he would come forward and talk to Story Musgrave, who had spent a considerable amount of time in Spain. Um, and also, interestingly, he was one who was more involved in you know, some of the black programs, like one of the cap satellite capabilities and maintenance and things like that. But he was very open to having these discussions. I want again, to you're, but, but you're back. The, the difference here, again, is the personal interest versus institutional responsibility. And what sure. Nelson is doing is saying, you know, institutionally, we agree to take this on, albeit, you know. See, if you're going to go to Mars, you want to return to, to uh, the moon and then step onto Mars and that. So... If you're going to do that, you're going to commit a lot of resources. By the way, the Apollo program, when it was up, was 4% uh, of the uh, uh, budget, government budget at the time. Uh, right now, NASA is closer to about 0.4%. So you're talking about mm. a tremendous amount of increase. So you've now got to go to the public and make the case that says, if I'm going to study this, yeah. you know, Here's why we're doing it and how it ought to be uh, of interest and what the potential return on investment is. And do you think there's an issue with the timing right now of, of this? Because the public are seeing rising prices on fuel, electric, gas, food, and obviously the Ukraine-Russian crisis, that it's an easy way to make a subject like this potentially go away again because yeah. the general <laughs> public aren't going to be up for yeah. it, are they? I'm not sure what you're paying for a liter for petrol in the UK right now, but uh, our gas across the board here is you know over five dollars. We use gallons before, but um, yeah, that, that's what people worry about. We're around about two pounds a liter at the minute, almost. Yeah, yeah, it's expensive. It's almost double what it was a year ago, uh, over a year ago. So it's uh, it's pricey. And, and I've had this conversation with colleagues and friends of mine about how in the UK can we push this conversation forward. And I, I've made the point, unfortunately, right now, the general public don't want to have a conversation about UFOs and the what might be because they care about the, the gas and electric prices going up again, we're hearing in October and January, and the cost of cost of living. So the conversation just falls so far down the pecking order. Yeah. Well, the difference is between, yeah, I'm interested, I'm willing to talk about that, versus not only am I willing to talk about that, I'm willing to pay for it too. And how do you see that changing? Is that going to have to then be a private organization investigating, like the Galileo Project, seeking third-party funding? Or again, is it going to be a case of a lot of different things have to fall into place well, at the same time? again... What I have stated and stated repeatedly, what we're looking at is at least as complex as cancer. So you start multiplying the amounts of money that we put into that, into hundreds of millions of dollars to billions in, in that research. And yeah, we've made you know, substantial increases in many areas, but we certainly haven't cured cancer by any stretch of the imagination. So if you're looking at a problem that's that complex, uh, you know, the few millions that we're putting into this research, interesting, you will probably make some advances. Um, yeah, no, I, I, well, I'll tell you, I have slides that, that I've talked about how I think it needs to be approached. The digression, let me know. But I said what you ought to look at is the human genome project. And that's one where you had billions and billions of uh, possibilities. Well, the difference there is we had international cooperation. You did have the best and brightest, many universities involved. And the key issue is data sharing. 
because the problems with phenomena now is having data in whatever area you're working on is the thing that's probably going to be directly attributable to whether or not you continue funding and you keep, you know, they're competing for the same minuscule funding sources. Uh, so until we say, if we're going to say this is serious, we ought to look at it, then I would look at, you know, and the answer with the human geo problem is they came ahead of schedule and uh, under, under budget, really unique for huge scientific ventures these days. But I think that's um, the approach that you've got to take. And again, the issue of data sharing is absolutely critical. Before we get on to listener questions, John, I want to ask you about the, the U.S. hearings that take, have taken place in the last couple of weeks and months, um, and also some of the legislation that may be coming in, and we're getting updates on that almost daily at the moment. Um, f- for yourself, a few things to cover then. Is there any one particular or any departments particularly that you would have testify in a hearing, and who would they be? I have no idea. And the problem here is it gets so emotional. Uh, in the United States, we worry more about having our guns than children. Uh, and it's just absolutely tragic. I'm firmly in belief that uh, you know weapons of war have no basis and ought to be in civilian society. My pet response to most of them is, oh, well, the gun would say, okay, how about nukes for everybody? You know, let's just go <laughs> on. Um, now, I don't know how you're going to uh, change America, and I don't use any one institution to do it. And uh, like I say, our Congress does not have the intestinal fortitude to uh, even begin to take on the fellow. Yeah, they did. There's a gun rights bill that just went through, but that's, that, they're nibbling at the edges. I mean, you really need to uh, take away or do something like Australia and uh, I think New Zealand or somebody got really serious. Um, and that's a buyback program to say, we're going to take them off the street. In the U.S. today, we have more guns than people. I mean, literally, the ratio is higher than one to one. And um, contrary to where they want to go, they say, well, we got mental health. And unless we are crazier than the rest of you in the world, you know, that is just not an excuse for what's going on. It's the gun, so. As we record this interview, uh, just in the last couple of days, it's looking like there's going to be language in the upcoming NDAA for 2023 that's going to clear the path for those with non-disclosure agreements to come forward and speak without fear of reproach on the UFO subject. Do you think this is a course of action that's going to get people openly testifying again, or is it still a potential dead end? I don't think there's that much. I mean, they could frankly wave the wand. Now, there are legitimate reasons for classification of some of the UFO data. And specifically, that has to do with protection of the capabilities of the sensor systems. Mm -hmm. Because you don't want to tell a potential adversary what you can see and what you can't see. And there's real anomalies here. But having said that, we are getting it. But there are ways to sanitize the information and get it out. I think among the things just is what's the prevalency uh, of the interactions uh, that they're seeing. And the other problem, of course, is from a government perspective, I mean, that's this much of it. This is a global issue. People are having these interactions as well. What the government does bring to the table, again, are really advanced sensor systems. And in some cases, brain power, if they want to do that. But that's what I think we should do, is get the best and brightest involved. Why do you think you mentioned those other countries that the U.S. leads the way in the UFO conversation right now? Because outside of the U.S., it seems relatively quiet. We've just had the civilian hearings in Brazil. The U.K., 
as a country, it, the conversation is almost non-existent, unfortunately, still. Why do you think the US is still at the forefront of the conversation? I, I don't, I'm not sure I'd agree with that. And you look at you know what's been reported from the reports that the UK in particular has released. But you look at other, other governments, a, a lot of it in Brazil, in Chile, uh, other countries around the world, uh, I think there many of the officials are worried about the giggle factor, which is still, you know, unfortunately uh, prevalent. Uh, so I don't think we're leading it. I, I think what you are seeing has more to do with the amount of mass media uh, that we have, and it has become more popular. So the problem with that is you get a phenomenal amount of crap uh, that, that comes along. Uh, with this as well. So one of the issues is discerning what's real and what not versus rumors that run rampant. One of the downsides of uh, classification has been that if you can't see into the box, then the public makes huge assumptions about what could possibly be there. Uh, unfortunately, most of them are wrong. I point out you know, back when, when we were doing the study, uh, which is 1980s, the vast majority of the information, even about things the government had seen, was in the public domain. Uh, what was not there, again, gets back to how did you get it and how good are those sensors? I've heard you, John, on a previous interview uh, say that we aren't at the point of even asking the right questions or knowing what the right questions are. If you did have one question that you could ask and get answered, what would that be? I, I have no idea. I, I really don't. I get asked that a lot. Not just one question, but the last line of my UFO book that I wrote said, we are at the front end of the phenomena. We are not even, haven't even, I don't think, defined what these phenomena are. We're not at the point of asking the right questions yet. Um, now, one of the key issues from my opening slides that I use at all briefings, and it covers many of the topics that we, we've talked about here, but from UFOs being one, of course, the abduction phenomena, uh, remote viewing, psychokinesis, and lots of work there, uh, fire walking, uh, post mortem communication, uh, communicating with the dead, life after death, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Even interspecies communication, particularly Sasquatch or any of them. It's my belief that these things are all interrelated and that consciousness is the key component. We go back to Max Planck, who addressed this and said, you know, consciousness is primary. Now, with the whole brain-mind continuum and debate that's going on, it's popular to think that the mind generates consciousness as opposed to maybe consciousness generates the mind and generates all physical things after that. We're still looking at quantum physics are now looking at it quite differently than we have to the past. I do not believe that the brain and the mind are, are the same thing by any stretch of the imagination. So we're going to have to come to a better understanding of consciousness. Um, I also in some of my uh, talks, it says, uh, this does get maybe a bit political, but it says, yes, you are your brother's keeper. And I, you know, we keep talking about globalists, you know, as being, you know, again, from a political perspective, a terrible thing globally. My notion is if you're thinking globally, you're thinking too small. That what we're dealing with is universal. And, uh, yeah, these interactions which you do, you know, can harm others. 
John, I've got a lot of interest in listener questions and I want to try and get some of these answered from you if you don't mind. So we'll, we'll bounce about a little bit with the listener questions here. Uh, and apologies if I've not got to yours because a lot of them were sent in. So maybe we'll get John back on in future to answer some more of those. Uh, John, the first question was from Tim. Uh, Tim asks, do you believe the Wilson memo is legitimate? If so, why would Admiral Thomas Wilson refer to you as dishonest? Uh, you have to talk to others about that. I, I don't even know how to address it. Uh, I know Wilson has said it didn't happen. But... Do you believe it did? Uh, I, I don't know how to address that. I wasn't there, certainly. I know Eric. Um, and yeah, again, I, I was surprised to see that actually introduced in the congressional hearing. So, uh, is uh, that pl pleasantly surprised? I I, I was surprised that uh, because the guy brought in some other things, it was totally wrong on at the same at the same time. So, he did bring up the Malmstrom instrument and, and talked about ten missiles being shut down. Was surprised that. Uh, Odie and I did not know about the incidents. They've not done a very good job from a historical perspective. But it wasn't 10 missiles that were shut down. In fact, with Bob Salas and Beta Giant, uh, which you found there that they had six to eight of their missiles shut down. I think that was Echo Site, but they called back to headquarters. November Site was down 10 for 10, so it's even greater than that. And is of great significance. If you understand the nuclear triad, you're dealing with things of strategic importance. Uh, and I also point out that um, Soviets, so Soviets at that time had other incidents that were similar, but interactions with their nuclear facilities that were uh, equally scary. A question from Luigi. Luigi asks, uh, you've said that Roswell was a secret project. Is this speculation or informed knowledge? Hey, I don't understand the question. Uh, <laughs> so your your opinion on Roswell, obviously I I've not got Luigi here to ask him to, to reframe the question. Uh, that's the wording, but uh, what's your opinion on the Roswell crash? Well, I'll give you my take, uh, and this is one that gets me into trouble because no matter what you do, the data from Roswell never all fit. Having said that, A, I am sure an incident happened. B, I'm equally sure that it was ours. And yes, it was super, super, super secret. And uh, I understand that. And it has been explained and has interest in the, and the material, the secret materials. Um, talked to Bill Burns about this. I saw him on a program and they had one where they brought in some thin films and they set it down and they had two people. One of them was Jesse Marcel Jr., who I think was absolutely straight arrow. And there was a staff sergeant who we believe had their hands on the material. And they walked in and said, have you, you know, do you see the material here? And they both went, yes, and pointed to the same thing. And it absolutely existed in 1947. So in your opinion, it was very much U.S. led. It, it was yeah. a secret project and absolutely not... of strategic importance and yes the material at uh, uh, Fort Worth the Dallas Fort Worth was switched uh, because they knew that the Soviets would be watching this had to do with, well, I'll tell you what it was it was the critical issue at that time was when are the Soviets going to pop their first nuke because until that time, we were the only one that had a nuclear weapon. And it was absolutely imperative that we understand when they had crossed that threshold because it changes the geopolitical you know, set of the world. 
and uh, it, it had to do with sensor systems that uh, that's what they were looking for. Question from Jean Francois. He says, Mr. Alexander, uh, you have said that you are 98% sure the US government is not in possession of non human technology. Can you elaborate on this? Uh, that's fairly definitive. Um, I've seen the stuff on meta materials, and the problem with almost all the samples I'm familiar with is the provenance. In other words, where did it really? come from and a lot of work being done looking at some things that have interesting characteristics uh what i'm 100 percent sure of is we have not done reverse engineering and are flying you know craft around or interspace or you know any place else or intergalactic travel or in that and my point is that if we understood UFOs to that point, flying things around would be relatively trivial. The point there, and you know what we discussed earlier, energy. You would have to understand a fundamental different source of energy, and that changes the world. And you do not see that. And the other thing is, even if you have zero point energy, whatever you want to look at, if you look at what it's taking to integrate, you know, solar energy, you know, electric cars are a great one that's coming along now. It's going to take decades to actually integrate that to where it becomes standard, uh, universally available, and all that. So if you had some other energy source. If I had a pound of unobtainium that could get a, you know, a million miles per pound, you couldn't put it in your car. <laughs> yeah. it, it wouldn't turn the, the crankshaft. So there's so much that goes beyond that. And so I'm absolutely sure that we have not seen those sorts of things and make those kind of advances. It would Question. change the geopolitical situation and do a lot towards stability in the world, actually. Uh, absolutely. Uh, a question from the Tree of Life. What phenomena from uh, Mr. Alexander's time working <coughs> with Stubblebine's psychic spies stood out most to him? And also, what's your take on the mechanics of spoon bending? <coughs> Excuse me. No, you're okay. Uh, yeah. I uh, think the spoon bending at first. We don't understand how it works period. What I can tell you is that psychokinesis does work. The closest that I heard of that made a lot of sense, if you know Bob John, who had been the Dean of the School of Engineering at Princeton, and we were in a meeting, I think it was actually at uh, the Office of Naval Research at, at the time, and these sorts of things came up. And what they're saying, and again, it gets back to a consciousness thing, or that what you're doing is information, because one of the questions that comes up is, where does the energy come from? If you were assuming that uh, energy can either be created or destroyed, so where's the energy that makes it bend? And he says, well, I think it's simpler than that. What's actually happening is it's the information that tells the spoon to be a spoon. And that changes and allows the spoon to move. I, th I think what they're asking is, you know, in terms of, you know, cloud bursting, remote viewing, and these various different types of, you know, phenomena, is there one you particularly find most intriguing? No, and I'll go back to my comment again when I'm doing presentations, and that is that these are all interrelated. And that uh, consciousness is obviously uh, fundamental to all of it. That consciousness idea is one that I think more and more people yeah, like to discuss now. That it's, you know, again, that connectivity between people. You've mentioned the universe and everything being yeah. connected would, would certainly make a lot more sense. Uh, question from Nathan. He asks, if you could go back and change how we study this phenomenon from the beginning, how would you change things? Or could we change things to study it in a more efficient way? 
I, again, that's that's a really tough question. I'm not sure you would change it, but you have to look at as these things progress. You've got to understand this is a constant progression, and so things are built one on the other. And so it's not until you start to understand pieces of it that you say, "Oh, I would change something else." So if you went back and changed it fundamentally back here, I'm not sure that would have helped. Uh, at all, that, that this is uh, science and whatnot is actually a process. And that um, I'll, I'll get very political here. Um, one of the things I was concerned about in the Middle East is when we started talking about we're going to create democracies. And it's, you know, now, democratization is a process, you know, certain steps that you have to go through in order to create the democracy and achieve that. I think the same thing is true in many of these science issues. There are certain steps that you've got to go through to get there. You can't just you know, jump and make quantum leaps to, to the end product without understanding it. I'll give you an example, nuclear weapons. I was at Los Alamos National Laboratory, which is a nuclear weapons lab. And uh, we're looking at a number of things. And as country, other countries were developing, this was late, I was say maybe 90, looking at countries kind of stumbling around. And our, our scientists were looking and said, that makes no sense whatsoever. You know, why in the world are they doing that? And they went to Gordon Sumner, who had hired many of the original nuclear scientists that had worked on it, they go, oh yeah, that's what we did. In other words, you had to go through this process. You couldn't just jump out to the uh, end product. The, the, the process, you know, the journey is important. A question from Bob McGuire. Bob attended the SCU event that you were part of recently, and he mentioned Eric Davis uh, was uh, someone you spoke to apparently outside for around 20 minutes. And Bob mentions, what was Eric upset about? And is that a conversation you can shed any light on? Um, what was he upset about? I don't know. I, I'll give Bob a call if he wants to. That's when you can get filled in on potentially later on. Um, looked a very interesting event with a lot of very interesting players at that event as well. I saw the, the pictures online and I would love to get over to one of those myself in, in the future. Um, the next question, John, it's a little bit of a longer one, so bear with me, but I've got some context behind it. This is from James Iandoli uh, from Engaging the Phenomena channel. And he's asked if I can ask you about the alleged Stephen Greer Stubblebine meeting or encounter at the 1992 TREAT event. And a TREAT event is treatment and research into experienced anomalous trauma. Um, James has a, a post on his YouTube channel about this. People can check out. Um, on that, there's claims that several intelligence community officials, including yourself, spoke to Dr. Greer in a hotel room, and he was offered either millions of dollars up front or access to this money for funding, but it couldn't go public. Um, you commented on the video yourself on YouTube, actually, around seven months ago, saying the event happened, but the rest is BS, uh, in follow-up to James asking if a private meeting <laughs> did happen with Dr. Greer. Um, can you confirm this or not? What I confirm is I did say it was bullshit, and it, it absolutely is. Nobody offered him anything. We were kind of surprised. Bert Subelbein was there. And um, I think this was one in Mesquite where he suddenly burst on the scene. Uh, I don't know of anybody who offered him a dime for anything. And thanks for that. And I appreciate you listening to that longer question as well. And uh, the, thanks to James for sending it in. And final question from Eric. Uh, can you share any details of any servicemen or women being injured by UAP that you are aware of? Well, uh, easy answer would be no. The other, there's a case of, oh, what's the famous case? I think over Ohio where a uh, 
aircraft, but this was fairly early on, but uh, did not have enough, you know, oxygen life support systems that went up there and supposedly went out of control and crashed and highly controversial as to what had caused that to crash. Now that certainly would be uh, on a specific example. Um, I guess one of the things I would recommend to people interested in following up um, particularly from Skinwalker Ranch. And one of the big issues has been the hitchhiker effect. Hmm. And all those people up there now, I will say I have not had that problem, but I do know several people who have. Uh, now, if you could, well, it's not directly UFOs, but I would recommend uh, Skinwalkers in the Pentagon. There's a book that uh, McCaskey, Colin Kelleher, and George Knapp Wrote. I'll hold that one up for, yeah, for that people who are watching. Yeah. yeah, that's the one, yeah. And uh, I had a chance to talk to Axel Rod and, uh, you know, the thing. Now, now, I'll give you the downside of where that all goes. People don't realize they talk about the UAP program in the uh, Pentagon and, you know, the incidents with the various carrier groups. All true and straightforward. This program, well, OSAP, really started uh, because of uh, George and Collins' earlier book, uh, Hunt for the Skinwalker. In other words, they were looking for creepy crawlers. So it was not restricted to, uh, you know, looking for UFOs per se. I think from a political perspective, this is very, very dangerous. Again, the, the political ramifications are, say, hey, you want to fund money to hunt werewolves? And again, you get from, if I were in opposition research, I'd say, you know, Marco wants to uh, fund, fund werewolf studies and he, he won't fund uh, children's health. Uh, so pick whatever the issue that that one actually comes from signs in Florida uh, that were down there because of you know so again it's a zero sum game. Uh, what is it that you're going to study? I find it very interesting. Again, I, I think it belongs in in the civilian sector, and that's certainly what uh, Brandon is doing. Um, I don't know, that's kind of rambling, I guess. <laughs> the answer, I mean, the short answer is I don't know of anybody who's been burned, but we do know of people, and Kip has looked at, I think, around 300 now of people who have had, but this is from interactions, you know, the secondary and tertiary effects, if you will, as opposed to I got burned by the UFOs. And there are cases of individuals who have had radiation burn. Uh, the most classic, I think, is Cash Landrum. Uh, if you go back to 1980, uh, absolutely happened. The, their story is highly credible in that they, uh, the amount of radio, uh, the damage, physical damage that occurred to them is directly proportional to the, uh, you know, their study. In other words, uh, Cash got out, got in front of the car. She had whole body radiation, died from leukemia later. Uh, Landrum was behind the door, didn't get as much. Cody, the little boy, got brief things, saying, ran around, jumped back. And those two who were shielded had less radiation so that they were physically exposed to some radiation is absolutely certain. Um, but the helicopters weren't ours. I can also guarantee that. John, it's been a fascinating discussion with you and I've appreciated your time. You've been very, very generous. And again, thank you for, for rescheduling 
there was a whole lot of questions I was sent over that I never got to. So hopefully in the near future, we can we can get to those at some point and get those answered as well, if you would do me the honour. Um, John, just before we finish up, is there anything you're working on at the moment? That uh, Have you got any more books coming out or any appearances coming up you can let anyone know of? No, I'm really, uh, uh, I have said I'm very concerned about where the world's going at the moment. I think that American democracy is in deep trouble, and you know where this all goes. And good luck with Boris and uh, follow on there in the UK. Yeah, I was going to say we we can't comment in the UK at the minute about anyone's political state, <laughs> given what's going on here. So it's uh, yeah. It's um it's all a bit of a mess all worldwide, but at least we've got the UFO subject to talk about to to take our minds off something else for a while. But John, again, thank you very much for your time. That is all for this week's show. Thank you very much for listening. Please remember to leave the podcast a review on your chosen platform. You can like, retweet and subscribe. That would all be very much appreciated. The shows are being uploaded onto YouTube as we speak more and more. You can sign up at patreon.com forward slash that UFO podcast to access the shows ad free as well. Please get in touch on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, that UFO podcast. Of course, on Twitter, it's at UFO, U-A-P-A-M. And again, folks, as always, keep looking up. You never know what you might see. It wasn't a Tic Tac and not quite a saucer, more like a hubcap designed by Chaucer. A little Baroque and quite steampunk, like Alice was playing bass for the Parliament of Folk. The little fucker hovered right outside of my window, and when I shoved out the screen, he made it an issue. I don't think he expected me to see his ass, but I'd had some champagne and smoked a little bit. Meditative game of fate full on meta. I can't imagine how it could have been any better. I got to the top of the stairs, and there he was. I'm like, you awake? I was about to abduct you, cuz.